Yes, Bio 6611. In this lecture, we will discuss post hoc testing after we've conducted our one way ANOVA test. We'll first introduce our motivating example again, just to keep it fresh in our minds, and discuss two broad camps or ways we might approach it with a couple methods for no formal correction for multiple comparisons or trying to account for the fact that we are doing multiple comparisons with our post hoc tests. So again, let's start with that motivation. Recall our example is the infant birth weight in pounds and the smoking status of the mother during the first trimester, where we had the four different groups of a never smoker, former smoker, light or heavy smoker. We saw here in our summary statistics that the mean birth weight is highest for never smokers and decreases with each increase in smoking status. Visually with our box plot, we can also see that the median decreases as well as we increase the amount of smoking. And we may wish to ask the question, what groups specifically are different from one another? Especially since it looks like we kind of have these maybe two different clusters potentially of never and former smokers compared to people who are smoking light or heavy to any extent. So again, what we discussed in the last lecture was in a one-way ANOVA model, which ultimately is testing what we call a global hypothesis. In other words, that all group means are equal versus that alternative that at least one group mean is different. We could state it in one way, as we see on the screen here, that the mean for group one is equal to the mean for group two, or mu one equals mu two, equals up to the mean for the jth group. And our alternative then again is that at least one of those is different. If we do our one-way ANOVA then, and we reject the null hypothesis that at least one of those means is different, a natural follow-up question we generally will have is, well, which group or what groups are different? One challenge though with addressing this question is how do we handle the multiple comparisons without inflating our family-wise or that overall type one error rate we discussed previously in our lecture of multiple comparisons? In this set of lectures, we'll introduce some approaches to post hoc testing or testing after the fact, after the global hypothesis says there may be a difference. And we'll see how we can do so when we try to account for the multiple comparisons in more or less strict approaches. This is primarily focusing here, though on the one way ANOVA that assumes those equal variances. So let's talk about the first strategy no formal correction for multiple comparisons. For example, a simple approach that we might naively take, or if we just aren't concerned about multiple comparison testing and inflating our overall type one error rate, would be to conduct a bunch of pairwise t-tests between all of our groups. For example, one way we can do so is by calculating a t-statistic for each of our group-wise comparisons, um, calculating that standard deviation s based on the group-specific data we have. For example, in our birth weight data, if we used like the t.test function in R, we could get a table that summarizes all of our pairwise comparisons, where we would note that we have three significant pairwise comparisons where the difference is less than a p-value of 0.05. And then we have three comparisons as well, where there are p-values greater than 0.05, suggesting there may not be a significant difference. However, if we are doing this one-way ANOVA test that assumes all group variances are equal, we actually could get a potentially more accurate estimate of sigma if we pooled all of the data together. For example, we could calculate a single uh, standard deviation or variance estimate S squared to use across all of our t-tests instead of calculating one specific for each pairwise comparison. We see if we do this, it looks pretty similar to before, but we'll replace our S with the term we calculated above, and we can also note that our comparison degrees of freedom will be different at n minus j, where n is our total overall sample size across all groups, and j is those number of groups. This test statistic is frequently known as the least significant difference, or LSD method. 
Some considerations are worth highlighting in this approach, because again we're in the section of our lecture that is not taking an explicit attempt to correct for multiple comparisons. The LSD post hoc test doesn't really correct for multiple comparisons. Instead, as we saw, it's going to use a pooled estimate of the standard deviation, which the benefit is that it gives us more degrees of freedom and increased power, so we're more likely to detect a difference if it truly exists. Now there is a caveat to this. If we are in the special case when we have only three groups, or j equals three, in that one situation the family-wise error rate will be controlled at our desired alpha type 1 error level. However, as j gets larger, our desired overall type 1 error rate is no longer controlled. So if we are concerned about maintaining that family-wise type 1 error rate, we will need to use other methods, or in practice apply something like a Bonferroni or an FDR correction to help rein in that uh, rampant runaway chance of making an incorrect conclusion across all of our tests. Alternatively as well, we'll see in the next section, we can also use some other formal post hoc testing strategies that account for multiple comparisons. But let's see how we can implement this in practice in either SAS or R. In SAS, we can use our PROC ANOVA function or procedure, and we can just specify this backslash LSD after the mean statement to give us this post hoc comparison. In R, we can implement this in a few different ways. One is using this post hoc test function from the desk tools package, or if we don't want to load any additional packages, there is a pairwise.t.test function in the default stats package. Here we see that we do need to fit the one-way ANOVA in a slightly different way than before, just to play nicely with the post hoc test um, function from desk tools. So here we use the AOV function, and we fit it in a similar way with our outcome of birth weight predicted by the groups for a mother smoking status in that first trimester. We'll see the results then for this post hoc test on the next slide, but we just feed it whatever that object we've stored the ANOVA results in, and then we specify the method we are interested in using for our comparisons, in this case the least significant difference, or LSD. We could also note though a comparison by using this pairwise.t.test function, which will automatically make the comparison by specifying the birth weight, group variable, and the adjustment method, which in this case will be equal to none. So the example from that post hoc test function in R shows us all of these possible pairwise combinations. One thing we can note here as well is that we have then our p-value with our asterisk to indicate the strength of the significance, just for a quick visual reference. We can see, for example, as well, it gives us the information about the difference and the confidence interval around it for any two group comparisons. For example, at the top we have heavy versus or heavy minus former smokers saying that heavy smokers have a birth weight that's 1.23 lower than former smokers for pounds and the corresponding confidence interval. We see here as well that we have then those three different comparisons, like we saw with the unadjusted comparison of the t test earlier that are significant at the 0.05 threshold. One way that can be helpful in some cases to help visualize the differences in our groups or to see what sort of meta groups may exist is to do so by indicating the different groups, potentially providing information, for example, about the actual estimate in their order from smallest to largest of the mean birth weight size, and then draw a line between groups that do not have significant differences. For example, we can see that in no pairwise combination are heavy and light comparisons different. However, we do see that heavy and former are significantly different with that 0.0314 p-value. Now if we look at a comparison for the light smoker group, we see that our light and former smokers are in fact still similar here, and so we can draw a line between those two, noting that the light smoking group kind of bridges our data between heavy and former, where heavy and former are different, but light being in between is not different from either. However, we don't draw that line over to the never smoker group because we see here, comparing them, we have a p-value of 0.0199, less than 0.05. Finally, we can then draw our final line connecting former and non-smokers because we do see that they have, again, an insignificant p-value greater than our 95% family-wise confidence level, 
And we can use this as a quick just visual comparison of how groups differ with respect to one another and think of how they might gather into subgroups. So that strategy represents an approach that doesn't explicitly account for multiple comparisons in the methodology. We also have an entire set of approaches though that can account for multiple comparisons to varying degrees. We introduced some of these in our multiple comparisons lecture, but we're going to reintroduce a few here to focus on. So again, that LSD method doesn't truly correct for multiple comparisons if we have three or more groups. But we do have multiple methods that do account for it. And we'll focus on again three here today in order from most to least conservative. One is that Bonferroni adjustment where for any number of tests we do, we can simply just divide whatever our alpha is by the number of tests. One thing to note is that it also goes by the name of Dunn's test. We also then have this intermediately conservative approach known as Tukey's Honestly Significant Difference or HSD. This will use the studentized range distribution for all of our pairwise comparisons. We won't delve into the technical details of this, but we'll see how we can apply it with Sasser R doing the work for us. But we can note that if we did have the case where we were assuming unequal variances like the Welch's ANOVA, an equivalent test to this one is the Games Howell test. And finally, the most liberal or least conservative of the tests we've included here is known as Dunnett's test. And it has a special consideration when we have several groups we wish to compare to one single controller reference group. For this reason, it's commonly used in clinical trials if we have multiple treatment groups with a shared control arm. We're going to walk through ex examples of each one of these three approaches in the output, but we can note that it's pretty easy to get the results in both SAS or R. For example, in SAS, we can use PROC GLM and then just specify the Dunnett, Bonferroni, and Tukey um, in the means line of the statement. In R, again, we will instead fit our ANOVA so it can play nice with that desk tools package and functions we'll see below. But then we can implement them in a few ways. For example, the Bonferroni or Dunn's test can be used uh, via the post hoc test function or the pairwise.t.test function where we just specify that we want to adjust the p-values using that Bonferroni correction. Tukey's HSD similarly has a desk tools equivalent and a base R stats package equivalent of Tukey's HSD. In Dunnett's test, we have the one version um, from desk tools here. One of the things to note as well is that, again, because we're comparing it to a single controller reference group, we can specify which one we wish that to be, and here we'll say it's the never smoking group. So let's start with that most conservative Bonferroni or Dunn's test example. The output we'll get from the function is pretty similar to what we saw for the LSD test before. We have all of our pairwise comparisons here, but the one difference now we see is that we have different conclusions for what may or may not be significant based on our output. By correcting four multiple comparisons in this approach to conserve the overall family-wise type one error rate, we see we now only have one significant comparison of the never smokers to the heavy smokers. And all the other groups have a p-value once we adjust for it of greater than 0.05. What we can then see as well is that they've adjusted as the confidence intervals to also exclude that null value that we would have otherwise um, in the confidence interval if the p-value is greater than 0.05 versus before when it was less than 0.05. What we can note as well below is that we can draw our lines again where if we look at the summary we can see that there are no significant comparisons between heavy and light and heavy and former or light and former. So we can draw a line connecting those three. However, heavy and non-smoker or never smoker are significantly different. So we stop that line there. Conversely, we have this line we can draw here between light, former, and never smokers or non-smokers because there are no significant differences there. However, again, never and heavy smokers are statistically different according to this Bonferroni or Dunn's test post hoc approach. We can note again as well that we have the slight difference here from before where we had three lines or more differences when we didn't correct for multiple comparisons. If we did a less conservative approach, in this case we actually see that we have the same general conclusion using Tukey's HSD. 
because this is still using the post hoc test um, function, we see that it really just replaces the method we've chosen, but keeps the general same setup of our distribution or the output here. What we can then do again is we note that in this case, because we have the exact same results, we can visually draw those lines below just to indicate where the groups are significantly similar or different for a quick takeaway, where we can then reference that and see that heavy and never smokers have no overlapping lines that connect them. So we do have a significant difference in those groups, but not between heavy, light, and former, or never light and former, respectively. Recall when we have a case where we have a specific controller reference group we wish to compare, we can then do Dunnett's test. And that'll be a little more efficient because we can compare specifically to that reference group and not do all pairwise comparisons. For example, we see if we set Never Smoker as our comparison group, we have different results than before. And even though our light and never smoker comparison is not quite below that threshold, it is closer than in any of the other examples. And again, that's because we're only doing three instead of all six possible pairwise comparisons. Here we can still note though that heavy and never smokers are statistically different based on our estimate with the Dunnett's test procedure. A few closing comments to keep in mind about post hoc testing. The first is that these different methods allow us to control that family-wise type 1 error rate to varying degrees. And there is no one best method to always use, it's really going to depend on your context and how strongly you wish to control that chance of making any type 1 error across all your multiple comparisons. It is important to as well note, it's possible for the one-way ANOVA to indicate there's a significant difference, so the global test suggests at least one group mean is different, but then you follow that up with a post hoc test and none of the group-wise comparisons or pairwise comparisons are significant. This will partially depend on the test you've chosen to do for your post hoc comparison and how strongly it controls the family-wise error rate. It doesn't mean there's no difference that truly exists. It really is an indication more that we may need future research or larger sample sizes to more definitively address the question. And this gets us to our third and final closing comment. In practice, if we a priori know a set of pairwise comparisons are of interest, we should really just design our analysis around those specific tests in order to best control our type 1 error rate and to maximize our power. While it can be interesting to do all possible pairwise comparisons, in certain cases, like with Dunnett's test, we may know that we specifically want to try doing our tests and account for them in a certain way without having to adjust for many, many comparisons that may ultimately not be of interest. And so with that, we'll look forward to our next lecture discussing a bit more about what we can do for other assumptions that may be violated for the ANOVA besides the equal variances, such as that assumption of normality and how we can non-parametrically address it.